In this video, we'll give two examples of the control variable approach to estimate the causal effect of X when X is endogenous, but conditionally exogenous given control variables. But before giving the examples, let me first give uh, you some more explanation of a result that we talked about in the video before that. Um, so in the video, before this one, we claimed that when X is correlated with U, the projection of U on X will be a non-trivial function of X. Now let me explain this a little bit more. So suppose that U and X are correlated, so it's not zero. Correlation is not zero or covariance is also not zero. Then let's try to see what the projection of U should be. A projection of U on X should be. Projection of U on X in general, it's a linear function of X by the definition of projection because projection is the best linear function of X that approximate the conditional mean of U given X. Right, so projection of U given X can be written as alpha zero plus alpha one X for some alpha zero, alpha one numbers. And now we want to connect alpha one to the covariance of U and X. How do we do that? To do that, we write the projection model in terms of this form. So we write U as the sum of the projection of U on X and some error term, epsilon. So epsilon is the projection residual after you project U on X. Now, from um, our one of our previous lectures, we know that the projection residual has expectation zero and it should also be orthogonal to the variable you project the right-hand side variable on. So epsilon should be orthogonal to X. The expected value of epsilon should be zero and there should be no correlation between X and epsilon other. Now, let's try to find out the covariance between U and X, given this knowledge. Covariance between U and X equals the covariance between alpha zero plus alpha one X plus epsilon and X. And now we're gonna use the properties for covariances. So covariances of sum of variables with another variable equals the sum of the covariance of each of the variables with this X variable. So therefore this covariance equals covariance of alpha zero with X is zero because alpha zero is a, a constant. And covariance of alpha one X and X plus covariance of epsilon and X. Notice that this is zero. So zero, I can just uh, ignore that. And now for the covariance between alpha one X and X, this alpha one is a constant, 
So it can be factored out of the covariance. That's also a property for covariances. So what's left is covariance of x and x. The covariance of x with itself is the variance of x. So therefore, that's alpha 1 times the variance of x plus this covariance is 0 by what we have here by the definition of uh, epsilon which is the projection residual after projecting u on x. So that is zero. So uh, the third term also doesn't need to be written here. Um, therefore, we have found covariance between u and x equals alpha one variance of x. So we have uh, obtained this. alpha one equals the covariance of u and x divided by the variance of x. So this is the formula for the slope coefficient in the projection of one variable on another, thing, uh, another variable. Alpha one equals the covariance between the two variables divided by the variance of x, okay? Um, so if covariance is not zero, that means alpha one is not zero. In fact, we know more than that. If we know covariance is positive, then this alpha one should also be positive. So what that means is um, if the endogeneity is such that, if the endogeneity is such that X and U are positively correlated, then the ordinarily square estimator from regressing Y on X uh, will be biased upward, we have a positive large sample bias. And if X and U are negatively correlated, their correlation is negative, then this bias would be negative as well. So the OLS from regressing Y on X will give us an estimator that has a downward bias. Okay, so um, that uh, is our brief digress from the examples. Now let's go to the examples of control variable regression. Let's, uh, we have two examples. Let's start with the first example. The first exam in the first example, consider Y being the test score of a school district. School district is our unit of uh, the unit of our data. Y is the test score of the school district. X is the student teacher ratio of the district. So that's how many students per teacher. And we are interested in the causal effects of X on Y. So we can write down this causal model. Um, in this causal model, this U summarizes all the other factors that um, affect test score but it's not student-teacher ratio, okay. Um, suppose now we make the simplifying assumption that U only contains or just mainly contains learning opportunities outside school. Suppose U only contains learning opportunities outside school for students in the district, um, as well as maybe some random noise independent of everything else. So U is composed of this learning opportunity outside school and some random noise. Suppose that we don't have experimental data, so X is not randomly assigned and it's possibly correlated with um, U. So student-teacher ratio may be correlated with learning opportunities outside school. It is commonly accepted that learning opportunities outside school is mainly determined, how, uh, determined by how wealthy the families are in the school district. Uh, the more wealthy district will have the, uh, the students in a more wealthy district will have more learning opportunities outside school because their parents will have more money to pay for them or we'll have more time to do them with them, to do the activities with them. So 
a wealthy district may also, on the other hand, a wealthy district may also have more funding for the schools because the wealthy district will have more expensive houses and the how the um, as real estate taxes is the main funding source for schools. So wealthy district will have more funding for schools and more funding for schools means the school can hire more teacher, which implies lower student teacher ratio. Okay, so wealthy district have more learning opportunities outside school and also lower student teacher ratio. So here, this mechanism creates a correlation between X and U. So that's part of U. So X is therefore endogenous in this situation. On the other hand, this mechanism also means that given wealth level of the district, X may only be determined by random year to year fluctuation of cohort size. And therefore, and that fluctuation is independent of outside learning opportunities. So this story also uh, makes it reasonable to think that given wealth level, X is no longer correlated with the error term, okay? So wealth level is the main channel through which X and U are correlated or the only channel through which X and U are correlated. If we fix that one, we shut down that channel, then X and U are no longer correlated. So that suggests it's reasonable to assume this conditional independence, conditional mean independence, okay, conditional random assignment of X given W. And W is a vector that measures the wealth level of the district. So how to find the Ws, uh, it helps to know the institutional details of, um, of the data set from which, uh, of the population from which the data set is drawn from. So the institutional de details are important for finding the control variables. In the United States, um, public school pupils from low income families receive free lunches at school. And suppose the data set has information about how many students in the school district are eligible for free lunch. That should give, uh, that should give us um, a relevant measure of wealth. School district with a high fraction of families um, eligible for free lunch are probably school district with more poor families and school district with more poor families may also have funding issues due to um, lower tax revenue from the poor families. So that suggests the percentage of students receiving free or reduced price lunch can be a good measure of wealth and therefore can be a variable that we put in the control variable vector. So suppose uh, that this measure, free lunch measure, is a very good measure, is a perfect measure, then given the level of free lunch eligibility of the school district, we can argue that X is no longer correlated with U. And then from the derivation in the previous video, if this holds, and if we in addition assume that U and W are related in a linear way, so conditional expectation of U given W is linear in W, then from the causal model, we can arrive at the conditional mean model. So the causal model, remember, is y equals beta zero plus beta one x plus u. And now in order to arrive at this conditional mean model, we simply take conditional expectation given x and w on both sides. And then use 
property of the conditional expectation operator. So conditional expectation of the sum equals the sum of the conditional expectations. And then use this conditional random assignment assumption as well as the linearity assumption on the conditional mean of u given w to arrive at this conditional mean model. Now, suppose both of these assumptions are correct, then this conditional mean model is correctly specified, then OLS regression of y on x and w will consistently estimate those coefficients. Um, in particular, it consistently estimates what we care about, beta one, which is the causal effect of student-teacher ratio. Now, uh, let's consider a data example using the data set, which I will post also. So CA school DTA uh, on California schools. Now, if we run the regression of Y test score on student teacher ratio, which is X and meal percentage, uh, the percentage of students eligible for free or reduced price lunch. So that is our W. You run a regression of Y on X and W, you get these estimates. And this coefficient is our estimate for the causal effect of student-teacher ratio. And we find that in, our, in the data set, uh, the effect is approximately one point, minus 1.12. That is reducing student-teacher ratio by one unit increases test score by 1.12 unit and with a robust standard error point 27. So, and on the other hand, if we do not use the control variable W, if we simply run an OLS regression of Y on X, we know because of the endogeneity of X, this OLS regression does not give us a consistent estimator for the causal effect of X. Uh, and indeed, it gives us an estimate that is much too big in absolute value than the one relative to the one uh, with the control variable. So you see that we have a negative bias in our estimate if we do not include the control variable that controls for wealth. Uh, and this negative bias is consistent with our uh, intuition because uh, the endogeneity of student-teacher ratio is such that student-teacher ratio is negatively correlated with the error term, error term, which remember the main element of the error term is the wealth of the district. So the student-teacher ratio is negatively correlated with the wealth of the district and therefore um, running OLS of Y on X without the control give us an estimate that is much too low. Okay, that, that is uh, biased downward. And what we find in the data is consistent with this intuition. So this estimate, which is biased downward, is lower than um, the one that is not biased downward, the one where we do control for the wealth level. So not controlling for the percentage of students receiving free lunch greatly overestimate the causal effect of student-teacher ratio on test score. Overestimate, I mean overestimate in absolute value, but it but because it's got a negative sign on it, so this is this estimate contain a, a downward bias. Now uh, we can continue this further. In the data set, we actually have another variable that could indicate district wealth as well, uh, which is the percentage of students who are English learners whose first language is not English. So those are usually the Hispanic first generation um, or second generation immigrants. And they are typically poor and they do not speak English as a first language. 
Um, so that percentage of students who are English learners is also a good measure of wealth, is also a measure of wealth. So you might consider include, including that as part of W as well. Including that as part of W as well, that is you can include both variables in your OLS regression, control variable OLS regression. If you do that, you find that um, the coefficient on student teacher ratio is reduced uh, a little bit more, um, but it doesn't, it's not reduced as dramatically as it did when you go from not including any control to including meal percentage. So it looks like um, English learner percentage maybe provide a little bit more information about wealth, but uh, not very much more. Once you control for meal percentage, um, you kind of do not have to control the other wealth measure. Of course, it doesn't hurt to control both either. So that's one example where you use the control variable to get a good estimate or better estimate for the causal effect. Now, uh, one word I want to say about this example is uh, up about the coefficient for the control variable. The meal percentage, the percentage of students who receive free lunch, has a coefficient that is minus 0.6. That is, the more students eating free lunch, the lower the test score. Does that mean we should get rid of the free lunch program? Well, clearly that is not the case. What is wrong with this argument? Why can we not say that we should get rid of the free lunch program based on this negative coefficient on free lunch percentage? What is wrong with this argument is that we cannot attach causal interpretation to the coefficient of the control variable because we do not have a causal model for that control variable. The causal model we have is the causal model for student-teacher ratio. And the conditional random assignment assumption is about student-teacher ratio, okay? This W variable is just a, um, a way to satisfy the conditional random assignment for the student-teacher ratio variable. Our focus is on this causal variable. So the control variable does not have a causal story yet. We do not have a causal story for the control variable. Therefore, we cannot attach causal interpretation on its coefficient. So if you are interested in studying the effect of the free lunch program, you should set up a causal model for the free lunch program and try to maybe argue for random assignment or conditional random assignment for that variable and try, if it's not randomly, randomly assigned, it's clearly not randomly assigned free lunch. Um, you may want to find some other control variables given which the free lunch percentage becomes randomly assigned um, and then go from there, right? So the, the bottom line of this page is that let's not attach causal interpretation on the coefficients of the control variables, okay? Our focus is on X and we only interpret this coefficient as causal effect estimate. <clears throat> 